Hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. If you didn't know it, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's a given Thursday. We're happy about that. It's the, it's the day of the debate. Mm. We're going to see what happens tonight in the debate, the second debate, the presidential debate. You should watch it just to see mm, how people conduct themselves. Okay, and we're talking tax with Tom, Tom Yamachika, the Hawaii uh, Tax Foundation. Uh, and we're talking today about the revised suspension of the Hawaii Procurement Code. That, uh, that reminds me of uh, the new uh, Borak movie. It's called uh, Borak uh, Supplemental Movie Film. And it's opening also tomorrow. Very interesting. So welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show, Jay. Uh, you uh, uh, certainly know all that trivia. <laughs> I don't consider Borak trivia. I saw the trailer and it's hysterical. And it's now. It's now, you'll see what I mean. It's very now. Very good. So <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna talk about the, uh, we're talking about the procurement code. You know, I, I served on uh, the uh, High Tech Development Corporation, which is a, a attached agency. Uh, they changed the name since to the Hawaii Tech Development Corporation. And the procurement code was a pretty scary business because you had to go through all these hoops to get anything done. And a lot of people in government didn't like it much. And I suppose that weighed heavy on David Ige when he suspended it in his earlier proclamation on the subject. So can you talk about the procurement code? We've talked about it before. And can you tell us uh, you know, what people think of it and thought of it and why it is at least some degree controversial? Sure. The procurement code is the process by which uh, government agencies uh, buy things. So uh, it, it, it probably uh, isn't out of most people's memory uh, that, you know, before the procurement code was enacted, it was really the Wild West. Uh, government could buy from whoever it knew. You didn't have to have competitive bids. Uh, you, had, you didn't really uh, have to have criteria for considering the competitive bids when they did come in. Uh, and uh, it was open to all kinds of arbitrariness and corruption. You know, not that any could be proved, but at least the possibility was there. Uh, the, the procurement code uh, basically puts a framework around most of that, especially for the large purchases, uh, so that you have um, uh, sealed bidding for a lot of jobs. Uh, you have evaluation using known criteria. The criteria is made available to the bidders uh, during the process. Um, if, uh, you know, one non-successful bidder thinks that they have been uh, wronged uh, under the criteria in the procurement code, they can sue. Uh, and there's a process uh, in the statute for that. Okay. Now, a couple of weeks ago on this show, you may recall, Jay, uh, we talked about the procurement code. And, uh, uh, and I was complaining, among other things, that uh, uh, the, the procurement code was suspended in full uh, with just one stroke of a pen. And, uh, you know, let me show you uh, on slide one here uh, what that looks like. Uh, this slide one is a page uh, from the governor's emergency proclamation, the 13th emergency proclamation. Uh, as you can see, uh, section 103D uh, and 103F uh, are listed in just two lines. And each line says the entire chapter is suspended in its entirety. Okay because the, in the intro uh, to the section uh, where these uh, entries are made is you know, the following laws or portions of laws are suspended. Okay, so one sentence wipes out all of 103D, one sentence wipes out all of 103F. 103D is the general procurement code, 103F is the procurement code as it applies to uh, health and human services, I believe, purchases. So, you know, was there a reason given? I mean, because uh, this is supposed to be for an emergency and um, it strikes me that uh, that's, that's overkill. Um, you don't need to knock out the procurement code uh, in the time of COVID. Um, it yeah, and that's the point that we made. With COVID. Yeah, and that, that's what we discussed in our, part, in our uh, show a couple of weeks ago and, and also the point uh, that was made in the Civil Beat article that came out shortly thereafter. Um, uh, you know, we said, hey, look, you know, you've got some big, big projects uh, like Honolulu Rail and the stadium. Uh, they are um, you know, a serious expenditure of tax taxpayer dollars. 
multiple millions, billions of dollars. And uh, if you tear up the entire process under which these purchases are made, uh, you're going to lose a lot of taxpayer accountability. And um, apparently somebody was listening. Uh, a few days after the, the civil beat uh, story broke, I got an email from uh, a very high placed uh, you know, person in not, not the government, uh, but a communications firm, PR firm that was hired by the government. And they said, oh, you know, uh, you know, we don't do this. You know, we've, we go by the procurement code. DAGS goes up by, by the procurement code. Uh, you know, everything's fair and above board. And I said, well, you look at the, you look at the proclamation, you can't tell that. Uh, and, and, and my point is, you know, uh, to the ordinary person uh, trying to take a look at what government does, uh, these laws are suspended in full. And what that means is there's no procurement code. There's no um, bidding process required. There is no bid contest process uh, necessary or allowed. And um, uh, and you're right. That's overkill. I said. I said in the article. I could see that uh, if we got an actual emergency, we're trying to purchase emergency goods and services, and we don't have the time to you know futz around with uh, with the three months for bidding because we're in an emergency. I said I can see that. Uh, you know, even somebody as insensitive as myself can see that. Uh, but you know, but hypothetically. Um, there were there was a need for masks and ventilators and PPE and what have you, uh, and I'm just wondering: did, did the state government, or for that matter, the counties, um, take advantage? I mean, as perhaps they should have, of the lack of a procurement code in order to acquire masks and ventilators and PPE, or or did this just happen without any significant effect? Uh, we don't know. I don't know. Um, could have happened. Uh, I, I'm not in the uh, you know, industry of providing face masks and stuff like that, so I don't know what the uh, the government's procurement documents looked like, if any, if any there were. Um, so from uh, the time the time the um, the proclamation came out till the time uh, you got this email indicating a governor's intention to reverse himself. How much time went by? And, and I'm asking you that because I know that emergency proclamations have a limited life. They don't last forever. So the question is how, how long did this one stay in effect? And what, was it consistent with uh, the rule about emergency proclamations last what, 60 days, I think? Well, you know, what's been happening uh, is uh, one emergency proclamation came out proclamations last for 60 days, okay? And then on the you know, 58th or 59th day, a second emergency proclamation comes out saying, oh, by the way, we're still in an emergency. Um, emergency conditions still do exist. So I'm you know, restating uh, uh, the, uh, the proclamation in full, and here it is. So, uh, so we now have the first supplementary emergency proclamation, okay? Uh, the one that we were talking about in the uh, in the Civil Beat article two weeks ago was uh, the 13th supplementary proclamation. So it's number 14 in the series. So this is this is the number of times uh, the proclamation's been renewed. Okay, and the one that came out two days ago uh, was the 14th supplementary proclamation. And this is where the changes occurred. So. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, a few days later, I got the email, and then you know, a couple of days ago, um, which was you know maybe a, a week after I responded to the email, uh, the the proclamation comes up with revised language, and let's see what the what the language says. So, let, can you pull up slide number two A, please? Okay, so so what they're saying in this uh, is that the is that the public procurement code is suspended only uh, to the extent necessary, limited extent necessary, to procure goods and services in direct response to COVID-19 uh, 
to procure goods and services using funding that must be expended on or before December 31st, 2020, and uh, to procure goods and services not in direct response to COVID-19, but for which a certain procurement requirements cannot reasonably be met through the regular procurement process due to the emergency, which is a much more tailored uh, fix to the procurement code than just whacking it all together. Uh, let's go to slide 2B. Uh, Tom, did you say that this was supposed to extend to December 31st, 2020? Uh, the pro proclamations... Um, because that's uh, more than 60 days. Yeah, no, no. The, what, the, what the proclamation says uh, is that you, you can suspend this nece as necessary to procure goods and services using funding that must be expended on or before December 31st, 2020. So okay. in other words, if you're using federal monies, uh, that $1.25 billion that came in from the feds, one of the stipulations that the feds put on it was you got to use it and you got to use it before the end of the year. If you don't, it goes away. Yeah, we've talked about that too. That too. So, um, uh, so let's take a look at the uh, slide 2B, which is 103F. It's basically the same thing. So uh, for purchases of health and human services, um, you know, to the limited extent necessary. Okay, uh, I think that's that's a win. Uh, I think that's a win for all taxpayers, uh, for government for, for government accountability, and I think it's a testament to uh, you know uh, civil beat and to to this show among other things. Because somebody was watching. Uh, somebody. Uh, thought it important enough uh, to, you know, fix uh, what obviously was messed up. And it was messed up. Yeah, so uh, let me, a couple of questions come to mind right right here at this point in the discussion. Number one is, um, you know, when, when the term emergency was used in the enabling legislation, which I suppose was some time ago, uh, to allow the governor to issue emergency proclamations, that's not a matter of right, it's a matter of statute. That, that's um, correct. So yeah, the, yeah, chapter 127A of the Hawaii Revised Statutes. Uh, does this demonstrate that we need to take a look at that? Because, you know, an, an emergency would be a hurricane, right? Tidal wave, um, some kind of dramatic natural calamity. Um, who knows? Well, you know, I, I think, think whenever you have something uh, that results in a bunch of people being carted off in body bags, uh, you had an emergency. Yeah, but so. the whole the time frame is what I'm talking about. So you have a 60 day time frame, but COVID is an emergency. Uh, no argument there. That would last much longer. I mean, does this, do we have to be more nuanced in that statute now that we've had the COVID experience? Well, uh, I think the statute is broad and it's broad for a reason because you, you really don't have a way of figuring out what kind of emergency is going to come up, except that it's going to endanger human life, uh, which this which this obviously did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so my problem is not with the, uh, uh, you know, with with the breadth of the statute that says, okay, you have these these powers in an emergency. What my problem is is that there are a lot of legal suspensions, law suspensions that are happening uh, that are unrelated to the emergency. And this was one of them, okay, be, you know, be, be before the suspension got revised. You know, what does having a, a bid contest process have to do with the emergency? Um, my, sec my second concern about the conversation so far is let's take rail. So there was a period of time here, you know, actually a long period of time where, where the uh, procurement code was in fact suspended. And theoretically, as you have described it from a legal point of view, um, a lot of agencies, including rail, could have gone out and bought all kinds of stuff for a lot of money without competitive bidding, without the protections of the procurement code. Did they? Is there any indication of that? Well, I, I, I don't know. Um, but what I was told by the, uh, in the public relations firm is that you know, the, the Department of Accounting and General Services uh, has had never operated in that manner. And they're the ones who release the checks. So, you know, maybe, maybe we were safe. Maybe, you know, maybe the cat didn't run out of the, uh, didn't run out of the house, the cow didn't run out of the barn door. 
And my last question, at least at this point in the conversation is, uh, so what about the procurement code? I was telling you that in, in the uh, Hawaii Tech Development Corporation back 20 years ago, people really uh, had concern about it because it was so bureaucratic and it took so long to get anything. And there was a bureaucracy and then there was the procurement code bureaucracy on top of that. And it slowed the state you know, process down a lot. People would sit on these applications and you couldn't buy anything until you got through the other side. Now, I'm not saying the idea of the code was a bad idea. I'm just saying that the people in government really didn't like it. The ones that I knew really didn't like it. And maybe this raises the question of, uh, you know, I think David Ige and his advisors said to themselves, gee, this is a very bureaucratic statute. Nobody likes the statute. Let's suspend the statute because we're in an emergency. Let's just put the whole thing on ice. And, and part of that, okay, I think, I think part of that is because there's a general culture point about how it is a pain. It is a bureaucratic pain. And I'm wondering if we learned anything about, about the, the procurement code here um, to suggest that maybe it ought to be eased up or changed. Maybe it ought to be brought more current to deal with the realities. We cannot tolerate bureaucracy in the state as it has, uh, it has stymied our growth and our development. And it is even more troublesome now that it would stymie our growth and development. So can't something be done um, to create a, a more a friendlier, warmer, um, more efficient procurement code here? Well, I, I'm not, um, I, I do know that uh, many government agencies hate it. Uh, the, the, the processes in it are kind of arcane. Uh, it could use some streamlining, I think. Uh, and I think uh, you know, th there's a process that people got to go through to uh, to change it. Um, it. It may involve you know getting some uh, you know some expert help, and then and then getting some stakeholder input to uh, to to come up with something that we that we hope works or works better than the current system. Um, and, well, so uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a balloon in the air, you know. It's an issue that this whole affair has raised, at least in my mind. And uh, somewhere yeah, no, along I mean, the line, somebody the, should take the, a look at it. The, the procurement process in general uh, has been a thorn in, in everybody's side for years, uh, just as the collective bargaining process has been, uh, just like the permitting process has been. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are mired in bureaucracy that really shouldn't be, uh, that, that other jurisdictions have a way better handle on than we do and, and that we ought to start doing something about it so that we can get ourselves out of this morass uh, and start you know, coming up yeah. with a functional um, you know, way uh, that the business of government can be conducted with some accountability uh, but at the same time not take forever. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's been one of those sacred cow things where nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, in ordinary times, you know, uh, the, the general view around government and around in public, in the public opinion was, well, it may be a pain, but we need it, so let's leave it alone. It's a morass to start trying to change it because it's complicated. Nobody really cares about the technical aspects of procurement. But now that we've had this experience, now that the, the civil beat article appeared and, and pointing, pointing out what was going on, now that um, there's some publicity going out over the over the uh, the proclamation and the code, maybe now is a good time to start thinking about what we can do, because now we're we're at the threshold of a long period of time where the state really has to work to regain its uh, its economy, and we cannot afford to have bureaucracy. I mean, even today there was a there was a piece about how maybe tourism, which everybody was so excited about a few days ago. 10,000 tourists come, even though that, 10,000, yeah, even though 10, that's a small, small number, um, now it's flattening out, okay? So we, we think that as long as we open the door to tourism, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna be banging, banging at the door. Um, but that's not necessarily so because we have spiking going on all over the country, the world, we have limitations on travel. And the assumption that people would just come as soon as we opened it up, that's a, proving to be not completely, uh, you know, uh, uh, correct. So, 
uh, I think we, we really have to look at it. And these events that you've described make it clear that we have to look at all sides of this and learn by it. But I, but I, do, want to, I do want to ask you about, about the press. I want to ask you about civil beat. I want to ask you about the benefit. I mean, from the point of view of the tax foundation and the taxpayers and, you know, efficient operation, uh, honest operation in government, accountable operation in government. Uh, this is a good story, Tom. It's a good story that you wrote the piece in Civil Beat. It's a good story that Civil Beat entertains, uh, you know, articles like that. It's a good story that somebody in the governor's office or perhaps in their uh, public relations firm was looking at what the press was saying. That's all a good story. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a tremendous win. Uh, it's a tremendous win for everybody. Uh, I, I, I really thank Civil Beat a lot for putting it out there. Uh, I, and I thank you a lot for putting it out there. Um, you know, uh, at some point somebody was listening, so somebody was reading. Uh, I, I'm not really sure which, but uh, the message got through and positive change happened, I think. Um, the, the, you know, the, the trend uh, with government has been, you know, uh, uh, shut down everything, uh, you know, close up all communications, suspend everything. Uh, and that has been dangerous, at least, you know, now uh, I think people are kind of coming to grips with how reckless that was, uh, what the implications were, and hopefully they're changing a bit. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to learn how to be nuanced about this. We, we have to learn, uh, you know, what, what the, um, the right formula is. And we have to adjust things in the smartest way possible. Um, and we haven't quite learned that, but we are starting to learn that. This is an example of learning that. But, I, you know, I want to I go to the question of the media. You know, maybe this is a, a kind of turning point, although Civil Beat publishes a lot of things, including from you, um, you know, that are very candid and helpful if somebody would listen. And now somebody, you have evidence that somebody would listen. Maybe we have a new, a new dialogue, a new, we want to call it a, a media awareness by government. And uh, I can only think that um, Civil Beat should do more of this uh, about everything that happens. And the, and you ought to do as much writing as you can. I know it takes time. Um, and we certainly like to do shows about these things because we think that's the most important thing. Um, you know, news, current news, events, opinions, commentaries. But the question- Yeah, we, we try to get, you know, uh, people to take a look at things that, uh, that mainstream media really hasn't. Uh, sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't in so much depth. Uh, sometimes they do it in, in a lot of depth, but we look at it from another angle. So that's what we try to do. When you uh, when you write a piece um, or a piece is published um, by you um, or, or one of these shows, do you send it along to the governor's office? And query, will you do that in the future? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, it just comes out. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, not accountable to the to the to the governor uh, or or anybody in government about what I write. Uh, I, I do have you know my own board check it, but our organization is independent of the government, uh, so you know, we, we do things the way we see fit. Of course, but after the fact, after it's published, after this show, if for example, of a show like this or an article like you you write pretty much all the time, um, has a lot to do with the government and uh, accountability of the government and improving the government and all that. Um, they may be on your mailing list. They may be on the civil beat mailing list. They may be on our mailing list. But I think- Well, we yeah, I mean, there are people in government who have told me uh, that they read uh, uh, the, the civil beat uh, articles regularly uh, and, you know, elected, elected representatives have told me. So, uh, you know, messages get through, I think, at least to some people. Yeah. And the, the, the question, you know, the question becomes, um, you know, uh, is the message succinct enough to get to the right people? And, uh, but, 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 I, but I think, you know, the, the underlying problem is, you know, 
I would, I would prefer uh, th that there be no screw-ups for me to write about. Then, uh, you know, uh, life here in the Hawaii would be a lot better, a lot easier. Uh, government would be a lot, uh, you know, a lot better, uh, and and there would be no need for, you know, somebody like me to say, "Look, what the heck is going on here? Look, what the heck is going on here?" Well, I'm 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 thinking that um, there's there's a lesson in all of this. There's a, there's a lesson, well, to all of us about trying to address issues like this and about trying to make sure that the government knows about it, knows that you know there's been an article or a show or what have you. The problem is, and I'll tell you my personal problem, is so now we're in election season and I get an email from people on the mainland who would like me to vote for one state or federal candidate or another. And they all somehow have my email address. And I get not hundreds, but thousands of them every day. At the same time, I may get an email from you, Tom. And my problem is that I've got to sort out the wheat and the chaff. It's cacophony. And uh, so if, if every single thing that happened, if everybody who was concerned about government wrote to government, it would be cacophony. And the guy at the other end or the girl uh, on the fifth floor or in a PR firm would be, besieged, be you know, covered with these um, messages and articles and what have you. Inundated. And, and, yeah, go ahead. Inundated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I think there's a, there's a, that also has to be nuanced. It has to be from credible people like you. It has to be, a, a, you know, a, a certain interval, not every minute of every day. And it has to be about issues that are not, that are not, you know, Manini. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what we've got to think about. We've got to make this process that you experienced in the case of the procurement code happen again. And, and there ought to be a system by all the players to make sure that what you're saying uh, gets to the right place and that they treat it the right way. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, the, the first, I think, big shout that we did was uh, when we filed suit over the, uh, the rail scam. And uh, uh, it was kind of an extreme way of getting our message heard, but we did get heard. And there was some remedial action that took place. I mean, we, we, we lost the, we technically lost the suit, uh, but, the, but the rail scam went down from 10% to 1%. And we, and we still called that a you know, huge win for taxpayers. As it was. Yeah. Well, that's certainly something to watch uh, going forward, because as you and I have talked uh, about many times, is the state is in fiscal trouble and the state has to very carefully consider every dime it spends and it, it can't uh, fritter away the money. And, and um, we are we should all be concerned about that. The tax base has gone way down. Uh, people are leaving, taxpayers are leaving the state. The state is, the Council on Revenues is going to find less revenue. There'll be less for the legislature to spend. It has to be very select in how it spends that money. And, and for that matter, we're not getting any, for, any further CARES money right now. We may not get any for a long time. Um, so. If at all, yeah. If at, if at all, yeah. And so, um, you know, that's, that's an area where the Tax Foundation of Hawaii will be very useful, very helpful to see how we're spending what little resources we have. Yeah, that's a very important point to, to ponder. Uh, that's you know, our, our main mission is to help you know, taxpayers, uh, government and, and everybody understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, so, so we can have you know, a fuller discussion and, Fairity well, that that's the real emergency, the fiscal emergency, if you will. What did I, what did I read? The state deficit is huge now. It's significantly more than it was uh, just uh, just four or five years ago. Um, the state is really unable to pay a lot of bills, to wit, the uh, employees' retirement system and others. And so, well, I mean, one, on, one, one reason why that happened is, uh, you know. Uh, the governor had to figure out a way to pay current bills. So he said, all right, 
we're going to defer our contribution to the retirement system and to the health fund. Uh, and we're going to skip a one year one year's whole payment to the tune of what is it five hundred million dollars? That has consequences. Okay. That, uh, uh, you know, he may not have had a choice because our, our budget hole is so dire. Uh, but the fact of the matter remains is we've we've made commitments to uh, you know the employees that we've had. Uh, they've earned these uh, uh, health benefits and pension benefits, and our state constitution says we can't reduce them. So uh, uh, we've got we've got debts to pay. Yeah, and we've got unknown liabilities too. I mean, for example, a, a storm would cost us a fortune. Sea see change, sea level rise, and climate change will inevitably and soon cost us a fortune. We don't have reserves for that, um, but we need to deal with it in order to save ourselves. So we better get reserves or find a way. And raising taxes is not the simple answer. It's good uh, disciplined fiscal policy that's the answer. So I'm only saying- Yeah, that, that oh, plus government doesn't have to be everything to everybody. Yes. Um, you know, we need to make sure the services that we're paying for the ones we need uh, and, and the stuff that we'd like to have. Yeah, maybe that's, that's you know, time for another day because we don't have the money. Yeah, all I'm saying, and Tom, is, all I'm saying is keep up the good work. Tom Yamachika, a great success. Congratulations on ha having an effect on government policy in this, in this case. Um, talk to you soon with more. Thank you, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Aloha. Thanks for having me on the show.